The bizarre chain of events linked to the Mothman all kicked off on November 12, 1966, near Clendenin, West Virginia. It was a fairly ordinary day, with five men hard at work in the local cemetery, diligently preparing a grave for burial. However, their routine task took a strange turn when they witnessed something unimaginable. Rising from the nearby trees, they witnessed a figure resembling a brown human being take flight, soaring over their heads with wings outstretched. The men stood there dumbfounded, unable to comprehend what they had just witnessed. It certainly wasn't a bird. It seemed more like a large human with wings. Little did they know, this peculiar encounter would be just the beginning, setting off a chain reaction of sightings that would electrify the entire region. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Ah, the Mothman. I'm fairly confident that, if you're watching this video, you already have at least a rough idea of the Mothman phenomenon. In this video, we're going to dive into how it all started, the sheer multitude of Mothman encounters, and more importantly, is it all actually true? So, sit back, relax, grab a wee cup of tea, and let's get started. Three days after these grave workers saw what they saw, so on the evening of November 15th, things took a bizarre turn for two young married couples as they cruised past an old TNT plant near Point Pleasant, also in West Virginia. They catch sight of two enormous eyes fixed onto a figure resembling a man, only larger, standing about seven feet tall. But here's the thing, it had massive wings neatly folded against its back. As the creature made its way towards the plant's entrance, panic set in for both the couples, prompting them to hit the gas and bolt. But the strangeness didn't end there. Moments later, they spot the same eerie creature being perched on a hillside nearby, its wings unfurled as it took to the sky. Somehow, this creature kept pace with their speeding car, clocking in at over 100 miles per hour. That bird matched our speed, recalled one of the group members. They wasted no time in reporting this encounter to Deputy Sheriff Millard Halstead, detailing how the creature tailed them down Highway 62 right up until the city limits of Point Pleasant. And as if that wasn't enough, they soon learned that they weren't the only ones to witness the bizarre sight that night. Another group of four individuals reported sighting this creature, not just once, but on three separate occasions. Later that same night, around 10.30 and 90 miles away in Salem, another peculiar incident unfolded. Newell Partridge, a local building contractor, was lounging in front of his television when things took an unexpected turn. Suddenly, the screen flickered into darkness, replaced by an odd pattern. Simultaneously, a strange high-pitched whine pierced through the air from outside, steadily rising before abruptly cutting off. Partridge would later say, that the only way that he could describe this sound was it sounded like a, an old generator powering up. Just then, Newell's German Shepherd dog, Bandit, ran into the front porch and began howling and barking frantically. Stepping outside, Partridge found Bandit fixated on the hay barn, which was roughly about 150 yards away from the house. Newell, already armed with a flashlight, took two steps off the porch and shone the light directly at the barn only to see a pair of large red eyes staring right back at him. He described this as looking like large bicycle reflectors. Convinced they weren't the eyes of any creature that he knew, Partridge felt a shiver run down his spine. Despite his calls for Bandit to stay put, the determined dog darted off across the yard, hot on the trail of whatever was there. I mean, Bandit was a fairly big dog and he was very protective over his owner. Partridge, torn between concern and fear, hurried back inside to go and fetch his gun. However, once indoors, his nerves got the better of him, leaving him too spooked to go and venture back outside again. That night, he slept with his gun close at hand, because poor bandit, well, he never returned. It wasn't until he came across the newspaper report detailing the sightings over in Point Pleasant that he started to piece things together. When he was scouring through this newspaper, it was one particular statement that really got his attention. A guy called Roger Scarberry, he was part of the two couples that encountered that peculiar bird man near the TNT plant. Well, he recounted seeing the carcass of a sizable dog along the roadside as they entered the Point Pleasant city limits. 
yet just a few minutes later, on their way back out of town, the dog had vanished without a trace. They even took a moment to search for the dog's body, certain that they had definitely passed it along the way before. Instantly, Partridge's mind went to Bandit, who mysteriously disappeared that same night, never to be seen again. The next day, on the 16th of November, the county courthouse hosted a press conference where these two couples who encountered the strange being near the TNT plant reiterated their chilling tale. Deputy Halstead, who had known them since they were young kids, well, he took their account very seriously. They've always been straight shooters, he assured investigators, finding no reason to doubt their sincerity. Many of the reporters that were present that day also shared this sentiment. The news of these bizarre sightings quickly spread across not only West Virginia, but the entire globe, captivating audiences far and wide. The press christened the strange flying entity, the Mothman. In the months that followed, the desolate and isolated TNT plant became synonymous with Mothman's domain. And it couldn't have picked a better fitting hideout, really. The surrounding area consisted of vast expanses of woodland and large concrete domes that once housed explosives during World War II. After the war, the plant became disused. Well, apart from the fact that it was used as a dumping ground for all manner of toxic waste. Besides that, an intricate network of tunnels crisscrossed the landscape, providing ample cover for this elusive creature to roam undetected. Beyond the man-made maze of tunnels, the area encompassed the McClintic Wildlife Station, a dense forested sanctuary teeming with woods, artificial ponds, and rugged terrain of ridges and hills. Much of this vast expanse was nearly impenetrable, providing ample hiding spots for this mothman to evade detection for extended periods of time. It was a realm where the creature could vanish without a trace, for weeks or even months on end. The only souls venturing into these depths were hunters, fishermen, and local teenagers seeking secluded hidden spots along the rutted dirt roads, which are known affectionately as lovers' lanes. It was around this time that all manner of high strangeness started to unfold. People reported seeing strange lights in the sky. Their televisions and other electrical equipment would mysteriously malfunction, often accompanied by the high-pitched screech of something nearby. Household pets would act out of character, growling or barking apparently nothing. People would also report receiving strange phone calls in the middle of the night, with no one being on the end of the line, and some even reported seeing strange men from out of town wearing black suits. Few residences dotted the landscape around the TNT plant and wildlife sanctuary, with one belonging to the Ralph Thomas family. On that night of November 16th, they were startled by a peculiar sight, a strange red light in the sky, maneuvering and hovering above the TNT plant. It sure as hell wasn't an airplane but we just couldn't work out what it could have been. A few minutes later, Mrs. Bennett pulled up to the Thomas house, accompanied by her young baby. As she stepped out of the car, a sudden movement caught her eye near the vehicle. The sight immediately startled Mrs. Bennett and sent shivers down her spine, so much so in fact that she accidentally dropped her little girl in her fright. Swiftly regaining her composure, she scooped up her kid and dashed towards the safety of the house. Once inside, the family barricaded themselves in, gripped by hysteria as this creature lumbered up onto the porch, peering ominously through the windows. Despite summoning the police, by the time the authorities arrived, this elusive creature had vanished without a trace. The encounter left Mrs. Bennett deeply shaken, and it would be months before she found any semblance of peace. So distressed was she that, that she sought medical help to cope with the overwhelming anxiety that had plagued her after this incident. Haunted by terrifying nightmares, she confided to investigators that she believed the creature had even paid a visit to her at her own home. She recounted hearing eerie sounds. She said it was like women's screams echoing near her isolated residence on the outskirts of Point Pleasant. Many people began to draw connections between the sightings of Mothman, UFO encounters, and run-ins with these mysterious men in black in the region. For close to a year, the area remained a hotbed of strange occurrences. Researchers, investigators and self-proclaimed monster hunters flocked to the area, but no one garnered as much attention as author John Keel. Keel, a notable figure in ufology and paranormal investigation, gained widespread recognition for his work, particularly through the movie The Mothman Prophecies, adapted from his own book of the same title. 
When Mothman sightings peaked, Keel embarked on a journey to Point Pleasant to delve into this mystery. Spending months interviewing witnesses, local reporters, and poring over police reports and folklore, Keel was determined to unravel the enigma that surrounds the Mothman. However, his quest for answers soon took a sinister turn. Keel began experiencing severe headaches and episodes of extreme paranoia. Cryptic messages would mysteriously appear on his answering machine, sometimes even without the phone ever actually ringing. He found himself under constant surveillance by shadowy figures clad in dark suits, a phenomenon he famously termed Men in Black. Yeah, the actual phrase Men in Black was created by this guy. You learn something new every day. You're welcome. Additionally, Keel noticed signs of tampering with his own mail and discovered that his phone was actually being tapped. While some speculated that the Mothman had extraterrestrial origins, Keel proposed an alternative theory. He suggested that this creature could be an ultra-terrestrial, an entity existing on Earth but in a different dimension, beyond our conventional perception of time and space. According to Keel, these beings have the ability to materialise and dematerialise at will, manipulating energy to traverse different wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum. Known by various names in various different cultures, such as spirits, fairies or angels, these entities remain a fascinating and elusive aspect of paranormal lore. Now, we've discussed John Keel in a previous video, The Smiling Man. In fact, that video has a direct correlation to this video. See, as with the Smiling Man case or the Indrid Cold case, we covered the incident of a guy called Woodrow Derenberger. So on November 2nd of 1966, three weeks before the graveyard lads saw that creature, Derenberger reported a creepy incident that took place as he was driving out one night. And when it turned crosswise, it slowed down. It started slowing, not abruptly or too fast, but it gave me plenty of time to step on my brakes and slow down with it. But it forced me to come to a complete stop. As soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me, or came to the truck. He walked to the right-hand side of the truck, and he told me to roll down the window. He asked me to roll down the window on my right-hand side of my truck. And I had done what he asked. And this man stood there, and he, uh, he first asked me what I was called. And I knew he meant my name, and I told him my name. And uh, he asked me, he said, uh, why are you frightened? He said, don't be frightened, we wish you no harm. He said, we mean you no harm, we wish you only happiness. And uh, I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Cold. That was the name that he was called by. Keel's beliefs extend to the notion that these mysterious beings have intervened in the lives of historical figures, such like Thomas Jefferson or Malcolm X, offering evidence of the enduring influence of the gods of old. These ancient entities, Keel suggests, manifest themselves through various forms, including UFO sightings, aliens, monsters, demons, angels, and even ghosts. Despite his own eccentricities, Keel garners respect in the field for his meticulous research and captivating writings, remaining a colourful character to many. In the history of the Mothman case, Keeley emerged as the principal chronicler. He documented that at least a hundred individuals claimed personal encounters with the creature between November 1966 and November 1967. According to their testimonies, the entity stood tall, ranging from five to seven feet, with a broader stature than a typical man, and moved about on legs resembling those of a human. Its eyes were positioned near the top of its shoulders, and it sported bat-like wings that glided gracefully rather than flapping vigorously during flight. Witnesses also described its murky skin as being either grey or brown, and it emitted a humming sound when it flew. Upon his arrival in December of 1966, John Keel wasted no time delving into the peculiar occurrences in Point Pleasant. Gathering first-hand accounts of Mothman sightings and even reports of UFO activity predating the creature's emergence, Keel embarked on a comprehensive investigation. You know what's even crazier and more bizarre than these strange Mothman sightings? 
the startling fact that of all my audience that watches my channel, 58% of you aren't even subscribed. I mean, it's right there. Look. Keel's findings revealed a string of anomalies, including disruptions with televisions and phones that had plagued the area since the fall of 66. Residents reported sightings of strange lights in the sky, particularly in the vicinity of the TNT plant. Additionally, passing cars occasionally experienced inexplicable stalling along the nearby road. Keel and his team of researchers uncovered a series of brief yet unsettling poltergeist incidents across the Ohio Valley region. Locked doors would mysteriously swing open and then close again. Unexplained thumps echoed both inside and outside of homes, and eerie voices often reverberated throughout the air. The James Lilly family, residing just south of the TNT plant, well, they found themselves besieged by such inexplicable events that they eventually chose to sell their home and then relocate to a different place entirely. Keel was steadfast in his belief that this flurry of activity were all interconnected, forming part of a larger mysterious puzzle. So, what's going on? Why now? Why were all these strange things happening now? And why was the Mothman being seen in Point Pleasant in 1966 and 1967? Well, before we answer that question, it's important to note that this is not the only place, or in fact, the only time, that the Mothman has been seen. Early on the morning of September 10th, 1978, in Freiburg, Germany, a group of miners were about to start work. As they headed towards the entrance of the mine shaft, they were startled to find that someone's already there. They would later claim that it was a large, hulking man wearing a really dark, long trench coat. This man was well over six feet tall. It wasn't until one of the miners shone his torch onto the man that things started to ramp up. As the man focused his attention on the group of miners, it quickly became apparent that he wasn't wearing a dark trench coat. These were wings, large leathery wings that were folded around the man's body. As they unfurled, they took up the entire chasm of the mine entrance and it let out a deafening shriek. Well, the miners, they said it sounded like 50 men roaring all together, along with the horrible screech of a large train applying its brakes. The men, well, I mean, they turned round and got the hell out of there. It was a short time later that the entire area was shook by a ground-shattering explosion coming from within the mine. A subsequent investigation revealed that on that morning, 36 miners would have been working in that mine, all scared away by something. The investigators claimed that, with 100% certainty, all of them would have perished down in that mine that morning. This creature became known as the Freeburg Shrieker. 1985, Chernobyl, Ukraine. Several workers in and around the power plant claimed to have seen a huge bird-like creature. They claimed it looked like an eight-foot-tall man with large wings. Strange occurrences began happening there. Weird lights in the sky were reported, strange static phone calls and experiences with strange men dressed in black. These strange occurrences would continue until the 26th of April in 1986, when the now infamous Chernobyl nuclear disaster would take place. This creature became known as the Black Bird of Chernobyl. Apparently there was a strange sighting of Mothman in Manhattan just prior to September 11th. So, I mean, it, it could be reasonable to assume then that this strange creature or supernatural entity, rather than causing catastrophe, is there to warn humans of impending doom. If that's the case, then he's not very good at his job, is he? So, let's go back and ask that question again. Back in Point Pleasant, why was he there? December 15th, 1967, at around 5pm, the 700-foot bridge connecting Point Pleasant to Ohio abruptly collapsed amidst the bustling rush hour traffic. Dozens of vehicles plunged into the murky depths of the Ohio River, claiming the lives of 46 individuals. Tragically, two bodies were never recovered, while the other 44 victims were laid to rest together in the town cemetery of Gallipolis, Ohio. For 40 years, the Silver Bridge spanned the Ohio River, linking Point Pleasant, West Virginia, with Canaga, Ohio linking those two points until 5.02 yesterday afternoon. Needless to say, the collapse of the Silver Bridge sent shockwaves across the entire nation, dominating headlines and drawing hordes of reporters and television crews to the town. 
Mary Heyer, amidst the chaos, endured sleepless nights as she navigated through the influx of media attention. The local community was plunged into a state of horror and disbelief. The echoes of the tragedy reverberating through the town to this day. During the week leading up to Christmas, Mary Heyer's office received an unexpected visitor. See, she was uh, she was a local reporter for the, the Athens Messenger, a newspaper there. Anyway, this visitor was a short, dark-skinned man clad in a black suit with a matching tie. His appearance, she said, carried a hint of the Orient with high cheekbones and narrow eyes, accompanied by an unfamiliar accent. Surprisingly, he showed little interest in the recent bridge disaster, but was rather keen on probing into local UFO sightings. Despite her busy schedule, Heyer attempted to accommodate him by offering a file of relevant press clippings. However, his persistence for a face-to-face -face conversation eventually led to his dismissal from the office completely. Curiously, that same night, several witnesses in the area who had reported sightings of these mysterious lights in the sky, well, they encountered an eerily similar visitor. Described as identical to the man who visited Heyer's office, he left each homeowner feeling uneasy and unsettled. Claiming to be a reporter from Cambridge, Ohio, he inadvertently revealed his unfamiliarity with the nearby city of Columbus, despite their immediate proximity. The identity of Mothman and the mystery surrounding the strange events in Point Pleasant remain just that shrouded in mystery. However, one thing seems certain. Mothman was no mere fabrication. With a multitude of credible witnesses attesting to having seen something, it's evident that there was more to these sightings than just mere imagination. One proposed explanation at the time suggested that Mothman could have been a sandhill crane. Although not native to that area, it could have migrated south from Canada. However, this explanation failed to satisfy Mothman witnesses, who absolutely insisted that what they encountered bore no resemblance to one of these crane birds. While some sightings may have had rational explanations, such as misidentifications of owls or other nocturnal creatures, even John Keel, a firm believer in the authenticity of Mothman, acknowledged the possibility of such cases. Yet Mothman's mystique still persists. The case boasts numerous multiple witnesses, sightings from individuals deemed to be reliable, even by law enforcement officials, making it challenging to simply dismiss all this as a mere figment of imagination. In the aftermath of the bridge collapse, many locals firmly believed that the Mothman was some sort of guardian angel, trying to warn them about the tragedy that was about to unfold. But what about all the other strange stuff? The phone calls, the men in black and the UFO sightings? Well. The strange thing is, these reports really only came long after the fact, long after John Keel's book was published. The Mothman Prophecies was a fictitious novel. The entire idea of the Mothman being connected to the Silver Bridge collapse, well that was entirely made up by Keel. The official number of Mothman encounters, according to Keel, as we mentioned earlier, was around a hundred. The real number is closer to half a dozen. The other 90 odd supposed encounters all came after the Mothman prophecies was released. If you delve into the witness testimony surrounding the bridge incident, no one even mentioned Men in Black or strange phone calls or strange lights in the sky until after the book was released. Some have speculated that the strange occurrences could be linked to the legendary Cornstalk curse purportedly placed upon Point Pleasant in the 1770s. Yet. If such phenomena can manifest in West Virginia, then why not elsewhere in the world? Could these window areas offer an explanation for the myriad of reports of phantom assailants, mysterious creatures and bizarre occurrences all across the globe? Let's put all the speculation, conjecture and supernatural entities aside. One thing we know for an absolute certainty. There was a tragic loss of life that day back in 1967, Point Pleasant. Everyone affected by the bridge collapse, everyone knew someone on the bridge that day, a friend, a co-worker, a family member. Maybe next time someone spots the Mothman, we should sit up and take notice. Because maybe, just maybe, it's a warning of things to come. That's it for this video folks, thank you ever so much for joining me on this wee journey. Stay safe out there, tell someone that you love them, and remember, no matter what, keep smiling.